requires that we put the focus on going a step further, that we engage those that are running the bureaucracies and that we have them go save a penny out of a dollar and that they do it for future generations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I reserve the balance of my time. Reserves her time. Who rises in opposition to the amendment? Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. First of all, I want to thank the gentlewoman from Tennessee again for her uh, steadfastness in trying to reduce spending. Uh, our committee had the, the, the lowest, uh, our, our spending level went back to 2006. And one, one of the benefits of, uh, of serving on the committee, and one of the reasons I traditionally oppose across the board cuts, 1%, 5%, 3%, is when you serve on the committee and you've already made substantial reductions, you do it in a careful and thoughtful manner. And when you're dealing with issues that relate to the nuclear stockpile, the reliability of that stockpile, the responsibility for taking care of nuclear waste and meeting consent decrees and court, court orders, and, and you're dealing with lives and property that relate to uh, issues of uh, uh, flooding and, and uh, 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 things that affect lives and property, literally. Billions of dollars of commerce that we heard about earlier this afternoon from those who represent Missouri and the, the Mississippi, the, the, really the bedrock of, I think, 44 percent of our nation's economy. Making these types of cuts, while it may feel good, w without having the benefit of what we had the benefit of, w which is debate and, and input from some of the nation's greatest experts, as well as obviously people from the administration. There's no way that I would support this reduction. I'd be pleased to yield to the ranking, Mr. Visclaus. I appreciate the gentleman for yielding, and thank you. I've stated the case well, and do want to join with you in my strong opposition to the gentlewoman's amendment, and I appreciate you yielding. I yield back. The gentleman Chairman. yields back his time. Chairman, how much time do I have remaining? The gentlelady has two and a half minutes remaining. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Georgia. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one minute. Well, I thank the General Lady, and I, and I want to thank you for your amendment, because you bring forth such a, an, an incredible issue that we can't just stop with what was passed out of the Appropriations Committee. There are members all across this body that have the opportunity to scour the legislation, and I'm on the committee, and, uh, and, and, and to improve upon the legislation. That's exactly what she's doing here by offering additional cuts. And Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, I want to bring up the fact that in the House, over the last five appropriations bills, there's been 250 amendments offered. Only 11 cutting amendments have been passed, and eight of these were by voice vote. So here on the floor of the House, and I guess I'm speaking to my colleagues in the Republican Party, we are not cutting any more than what comes out of the committee. And so far, out of these five appropriation bills, there's been $691 billion spent, and yet we've only cut $304 million in addition to that. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, as I think about where we are, I brought the analogy, and, and uh, trying to put this in context of where we are as a nation, that's two cents, just two pennies out of a gallon of gas, just two pennies. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll leave you that, my two cents worth on this appropriation. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield one minute to the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. The gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, I rise in support of this amendment. It's the last opportunity we have, really, to rein in spending that's literally bankrupting our country in this bill. It's interesting all the talk of the billions of dollars of subsidies that we continue to dole out to dubious enterprises are all unfulfilled promises of energy independence. You'd think after 30 years, those promises are starting to ring hollow. After 30 years of such promises, we're more dependent on foreign energy than when we began, and even deeper in debt. Uh, I rise also to draw to the attention of the House a provision of this measure relating to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Under current law, as that reserve is drawn down, either for maintenance or for market manipulation, the oil must be, uh, uh, the, the proceeds from the oil uh, must go back into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That guarantees that it's maintained in a constant state of readiness to provide for our national security. Whenever a dollar goes into that reserve, a dollar has to be, or comes out of that reserve, a dollar has to be put back into it until this bill. There's a half a billion dollars going, not, going out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve 
not to replenish the reserve, but to fund additional spending in this budget. That is a scandal. Uh, it's time we put a stop to it. All right, the, the, the gentle lady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just remind my colleagues, all the issues we address are important issues, but as Admiral Mullen has said, the greatest threat to our national security is our growing national debt. We're calling for another $306 million to be reduced from this bill. Ten conservative groups support this. Let's tighten our belts. Let's engage the bureaucracy. Let's put our country back on the path to fiscal health. Yield back. Gentle lady yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentle lady from Tennessee. Those in favor signify so by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair of the noes have it. Recorded vote, please. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentle lady from Tennessee will be postponed. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, Amendment Number 53. Je the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 53, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Harris of Maryland. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from Maryland and a, and a member opposed the amendment each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will try to be brief because this amendment follows up on an amendment that was adopted uh, by a voice vote by the committee uh, on the whole uh, just two days ago. This amendment is the second part of the amendment I offered on Monday of this week. That amendment reduced funding uh, for the, uh, by $6 million from EERE, and that would be enough to... Uh, to to uh, cut the funding uh, that this amendment uh, limits that would reduce funding for the international programs of EERE. It was an amendment endorsed by Citizens Against Government Waste. The international programs are a subset of the EERB, uh, EER, e, EERE budget and do not have their own line item in an appropriations bill, so because of that, this limitation amendment would be required to properly implement the spending reduction amendment, again, passed by the committee on Monday. This amendment clearly states that no funds may be spent on the international program activities of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, with the exception of the activities authorized in Section 917 of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. So this, uh, we removed $6 million in funding on Monday. There were $8 million recommended by the committee, therefore leaving $2 million in the program. Uh, the United States government has $1.5 trillion in debt borrowing 40 cents out of every dollar, and now is not the time to take our hard-earned, hard-borrowed dollars and spend them overseas. This program literally, and I will, read, I will read the programs funded under the international program, assist manufacturing facilities in China and India to reduce their energy use. Mr. Chairman, we should be keeping that money to help our factories reduce their energy use, not our international competitors. Improving energy efficiency in the Chinese building sector, Mr. Chairman, we should be improving our energy efficiency, not the Chinese building sector. Uh, partnering with the Kazakhstan government to provide training on industrial efficiency, Mr. Chairman, when we're borrowing this amount of money, we should be using it to promote our industrial efficiency, not the uh, Kazakhstan government. Furthermore, it does things like help build windmills in Mexico. And Mr. Chairman, we don't have the money to build windmills here. We have to borrow the money to do that. We shouldn't be borrowing money to build windmills in Mexico. Again, this uh, amendment implements the spending reduction already adopted on Monday, and I will reserve the balance of my time. General from Maryland reserves his time. Who rises in opposition to the amendment? General from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The amendment eliminates, as we know, the international cooperative programs of the Department of Energy that focus on developing innovative energy technologies. I appreciate and share the gentleman's concerns about activities that, that simply fund energy projects like installing windmills in other nations are not an appropriate use of taxpayers' dollars. There's nothing in this program that funds windmills, with all due respect. This is especially true when we must rein in spending and, and eliminate waste all around. But this is a good example of when a scalpel is needed to save the worthwhile programs instead of a blunt instrument that eliminates the entire program. The gentleman is correct that this program includes several activities, small activities, that the United States should not bankroll, however. However, many of the large activities within this program not only engender goodwill within countries like China, India, and Brazil, and Kazakhstan, which has been a tremendous ally in the war on terror, but they also increase economic opportunities abroad. 
The energy sectors in China and India are increasing in leaps and bounds. In just the last 10 years, China's energy consumption has more than doubled. China, India, and other nations' energy sectors represent an enormous economic opportunity for whoever will develop and supply energy technologies used in these rapidly growing countries. Cooperative programs eliminated by this amendment help U.S. industry and researchers gain access to these booming markets. May I repeat that? Gain access to booming markets. These programs don't cost much, but they leverage, let me say, leverage much more in international contexts and economic uh, opportunities. For this reason and many others, I, I oppose the legislation, uh, the amendment, and uh, yield to the ranking. Him in his opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Again, I think the chairman uh, stated the proposition very well, uh, but would point out that the program's technical assistance activities really do help prime markets uh, for clean technologies in major emerging economies uh, to support and encourage U.S. exports. Uh, so, again, uh, I am opposed to the amendment and appreciate the gentleman yielding. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. How much time do I have remaining? The gentleman has two and a half minutes remaining. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me read, just so we dispel any misconceptions that the committee might hold about what these programs are, let me read from the EERE website. Because we were saying this is a, these are developing countries. Well, China is not a developing country, Mr. Chairman. This is what it says. It says, the U.S. Department of Energy today announced $1 million in available funding to train energy assessors who will assist manufacturing facilities in China and India to reduce their energy use. Mr. Chairman, those aren't my words. They're the, they're the words of the department that is asking for funding for us to borrow money from China so that we can go to China to, quote, reduce their energy use. It goes on to say the EERE engages in multiple technology and policy efforts to improve energy efficiency in the Chinese building sector. These aren't my words, Mr. Chairman. These are the words of the DOE that wants us to borrow money from China, to spend money in China to, re to improve energy efficiency in the Chinese building sector. Let's go further on. It says, EERE partnered with the Kazakh government to provide training on Save Energy Now industrial efficiency in Kazakhstan. I would offer that if we want to do foreign aid, then we do it in the Department of State budget. With regards to these cooperative programs, they're not zeroed out. The chairman should know that these programs are, funded, are partially funded through the Department of State, and we don't affect the Department of State budget in this appropriation. But we do say is that the department has egregiously spent American taxpayer dollars. They are wasting taxpayer dollars. And with regards to wind power and windmills, I don't know what they're building in, in Mexico, but let me read from their website. Not my words, their website. EERE is involved in several projects currently underway including wind energy in Mexico. Now, Mr. Chairman, unless there is something else beside windmills that uses wind energy, the department says they are involved in projects involving windmills in Mexico. This country can't afford to make Chinese factories energy efficient and to build windmills in Mexico when we are borrowing 40 cents out of every dollar. 40 cents out of every dollar. Mr. Chairman, I urge adoption of this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. All time has expired. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. Those in favor signify so by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Gentleman from Maryland. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Mr. Clause 8 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland will be postponed. Gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Is the gentleman from Ohio the designee of the gentleman from New Jersey for purposes of offering the amendment? No. I'm here to... Uh, uh, purposes of a colloquy. colloquy. And, and uh, he will yield to me, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I need to strike the last word. The gentleman from New Jersey moves to strike and, the last and word. And I yield to the gentleman. Apologies. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Q here. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise for the purpose of asking the gentleman from New Jersey, the subcommittee chairman, to engage in a colloquy on the importance of solid oxide fuel cell technology and the need Appreciate to maintain it. sufficient funding levels for research and development of this critical asset. Mr. Chairman, I first want to commend you on the fine bill. This bill, which I know was full of difficult choices and competing priorities, comes in more than 16 percent less than the administration's request, marking a clear commitment to fiscal discipline and restraint. I understand that within the Fossil Energy Research and Development Account, the Committee has appropriated $25 million for the research, development and demonstration of solid oxide fuel cells. Is my understanding correct, Mr. Chairman? Will the gentleman yield? Um, I yield to the gentleman from New Jersey. The gentleman from Ohio is correct. As the Committee states in the report accompanying H.R. 2354, we believe solid oxide fuel cells systems have the potential to substantially increase the efficiency of clean coal power generation systems to create new opportunities for the efficient use of natural gas and to contribute significantly to the development of alternative fuel vehicles. Reclaiming my time, I appreciate the gentleman's kind words about the particular innovative technology. I believe that proper funding solid oxide fuel cell systems is an important step towards an all of the above energy policy. The technology will help increase American energy capacity, reduce emissions, reduce our dependence on imported oil, and encourage the sustainable use of domestic hydrocarbons, including coal, oil, and natural gas, particularly newly discovered shale gas in the Marcellus and Utica formations located within my home state of Ohio. It is my understanding that the Department of Energy's Solid State Energy Conversion Alliance, or SECA, is a model example of a public-private partnership that creates jobs, promotes private investment, and enhances our energy security. It is also my understanding that preserving the current funding level is paramount in protecting over 700 existing SECA-related private sector jobs. Moreover, ensuring timely commercialization of this technology will provide the basis for broader domestic economic growth, potentially paving the way for creating thousands more high-tech high-skilled American manufacturing jobs. Does the chairman agree with this understanding? I yield to the gentleman from New Jersey. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I want to assure the gentleman from Ohio of my agreement with the economic, environmental, and energy security benefits of this technology, that I will work to maintain this already reduced funding level as the Energy and Water Development Appropriation Bill moves forward. Reclaiming my time, I appreciate the gentleman's commitment to this technology and to working to ensure that this funding level, approximately 50 percent less than fiscal year 2011, is not needlessly reduced any further for the coming fiscal year. I again thank the gentleman from New Jersey and the ranking member from Indiana for their hard work on this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from New Jersey yields back his time. The gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment number 21 at the desk. Clerk will uh, designate the amendment. Amendment number 21, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Luke Meyer of Missouri. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke Meyer, and, and a gentleman opposed the or a member opposed the amendment. Each will control five minutes. The gentleman, the chair, recognizes the gentleman from New, from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Missouri River Basin is currently facing some of the worst flooding in its history. This devastation combined with the ongoing economic crisis and our aging inland waterways infrastructure means that now more than ever we must be focused and responsible with taxpayer funded projects. My amendment would prohibit funding for the, Mr. For the Missouri River Authorized Purposes Study, also known as Mr. Apps. This $25 million earmarked study comes on the heels of a comprehensive $35 million 17-year study completed in 2004 that showed that the current authorized purposes are important and should be maintained. For river communities, few issues are as important as flood control, water supply, power, and navigation. People in these communities rely on the river for their livelihoods and will do so today, tomorrow, and long after the floodwaters have receded. This Congress and this administration need to focus on protecting human life and property and maintaining the safety and soundness of our levees. We must also support the important commercial advantages provided to us by our inland waterways system. The Missouri River moves goods to market and is an important tool in both domestic and international trade. That's why the National Car and Growers Association, the American Waterways Operators, the Coalition to Protect the Missouri River, and the Missouri Farm Bureau support this amendment. 
The study puts in jeopardy the lower Missouri and the Mississippi rivers, which, should result in which could result in devastating consequences for navigation and transportation, resulting in barriers for waterway operators, agriculture, and every product that depends on the Missouri and Mississippi rivers to get to market. The current authorized uses of the Missouri River provide necessary resources and translate to continued economic stability, not only for Missourians, but also for many Americans living throughout the Missouri and lower Mississippi basins. We said we want to focus on creating and maintaining jobs. This Congress is on the brink of passing three major trade agreements and the ability of our inland waterways to transport manufactured and agricultural goods, goods purchased and grown by Americans, is as important as it ever has been. This study is duplicative and wasteful of taxpayer dollars. On this exact issue, we've, spent, we've already spent 17 years and $35 million on hundreds of public meetings and extensive lit litigation. Offered identical language during our first debate on the, on the fiscal year 2011 continuing resolution, that amendment passed by a vote of 245 to 176. I appreciate my colleagues who offered their support and hope that they to have their support again. While there is no funding in the underlying bill for Mr. Apps, I will remind my colleagues that in committee an, an amendment was adopted to allow the Corps of Engineers to use and receive non-federal funds to continue and complete ongoing federal studies. I need for my amendment, the need for my amendment is urgent as ever. Mr. Mr. Chairman, with that, I would like to uh, yield one minute to the uh, lady from Missouri, Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of Amendment Number 21, sponsored by my friend and colleague from Missouri. This amendment is a common sense idea to save tax dollars and ensure that the Missouri River focuses on protecting human life and property. It ensures $25 million of taxpayer dollars won't be wasted on a second study of the purposes of the Missouri River. A 17-year, $35 million study was just completed in 2004 to look at the purposes of this river. We don't need a second study and we don't need to squander the taxpayers' money in this way. Think about how much money is proposed for this study. $25 million. That's a lot of money. As a common sense person from Missouri, I have to ask, how does government spend that much money on a study? A half million dollars is a lot of money where I come from. How about a million or two? Think what the average family could do with one or two million dollars. But this, stu this study thinks that's not enough. It wants $25 million to study the river that's already been studied. Now is the time for common sense. Now is the time for fiscal sanity. Now is the time to stop spending money we don't have on things we don't need. Thank you. Gentle lady's time has expired. Gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I now yield one minute to the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Aiken. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, lady before me said it so eloquently and so simply. Why do we want to spend a whole lot of money? We're already in a crisis now huge debates about how are we going to control federal spending and here we find uh, this this uh, proposal to drop another 25 million to do a study that we've already done before and uh, first of all we could save a lot of money in this and that's a good idea of course why is it that somebody would make the proposal after we've done a 17 year a study that's supposed to work for 17 years and want to do it all over again well it's because they didn't like the results of the first study quite obviously and what did the first study prioritize well it prioritized first of all protecting human lives that's not exactly a bad uh, prioritization and that's in the context of flood control but it uh, also talked about their livelihoods not just their lives but their livelihoods and that was the transportation part that should also be a part of what the Missouri River is about and of course the water supply and, and the uh, the safety now the the proposal is is to make the priorities in something else look the Missouri River is a great resource we need to use it that way and prioritize our people their property and their prosperity. Thank time you. The time of the gentleman is expired. Gentleman from Missouri. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we yield back the balance of our time. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks time in opposition to the amendment? So they're seeing no, no one. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri. Those in favor signify so by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. Gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It uh, is undesignated at this time. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Luke Meyer of Missouri 
At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available in this act may be used to continue the study conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers pursuant to section 5018A1 of the Water Resources Development Act of 2007. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from Missouri will control five minutes and a member opposed will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In recent months, the Midwestern United States has been pummeled by severe weather that has destroyed land, homes, and even lives, particularly along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Citizens living within communities along the Missouri River have endured what is beginning to be referred to as the worst flooding in history. Just in this year alone, millions of taxpayer dollars have gone towards environmental restoration and recovery programs while operations and maintenance of our infrastructure has been terribly neglected. Because of this neglect, this year's record rainfall, snowfall, and subsequent snowmelt have created da extremely dangerous conditions that are growing more serious with each passing day. President Obama in his fiscal year 12 budget requested more than $72 million for the Missouri River Recovery Program which would primarily go towards the funding of environmental restoration studies and projects. This funding dwarfs the insufficient $6.1 million that was requested for an entire operations and maintenance fund that it supports the area covering the entire region from Sioux City to the mouth of the Missouri and St. Louis. It's preposterous to think that environmental projects are more important than the protection of human life. The Missouri River Ecosystem Restoration Plan, or Mr. Earp, is slated to receive $4 million or of the more than $72 million in federal funding that will go towards the Missouri River Recovery Program. This program is only one of the many Missouri re re Ecosystem Recovery Programs funded by American taxpayers, and Mr. Earp is one of the no fewer than 70 environmental and ecological studies focused on the Missouri River. The people who have to foot the bill for these studies and projects, many of which take years to complete and are ultimately inconclusive, are the very people who at the who are at risk of losing their farms, their businesses, their homes, and even their lives today. I do not take for granted the importance of river ecosystems. I grew up near the Missouri River, as did many of the people I represent in Congress. But we have now reached a point in our nation where we value the welfare of fish more than the welfare of human beings. Our priorities are backwards. My amendment supported by the Coalition to Protect the Missouri River and the Missouri Farm Bureau proposes a prohibition of funding for the Mr. Earps program. The end of the study will in no way jeopardize the Corps' ability to meet requirements under the Endangered Species Act. What this amendment will do is eliminate one of the many ecosystem studies along the river, a study that has become little more than a tool of administration for the promotion of the return of the river to its most natural state, with little regard for navigation, trade, power generation, or the, or the many people who depend on the Missouri River and adjacent lands for their livelihoods. This study has the potential to result in river management that is environmentally driven rather than focused on balancing the needs of the environment with those of, along the river and our wonderful communities. We've seen this same scenario play in our nation, on a nationwide basis. The result is increased unemployment, reduced trade, economic depression, and sometimes questionable environmental results. Mr. Chairman, the funding for Mr. Earp should go forward. Should, as, uh, the funding for should the funding for Mr. Uh, ERPs go forward, we must stop and think about what we're doing. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, to support our nation's river communities, and, you, and with that I yield uh, one minute to the gentlelady from uh, Missouri, uh, uh, Ms. Hartford. Gentlelady from Missouri is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, my Representative Lukenmeyer. I rise today in support of this amendment, and like he said, this amendment is about priorities. What is important, or better yet, who is important? I would contend that people are important. People along the Missouri River, people who are seeing their homes flooded and their livelihoods destroyed due to flooding. Crops, businesses, and homes are underwater as levees have been breached and overtops in parts of Missouri. Now is the time to refocus our attention on what matters as we manage the Missouri River. We need to protect people and property. The President's 2012 budget, as uh, Representative Luckenmeyer said, requested $72 million to recover the river for two birds and one fish, but only $6.1 million for operations and maintenance, maintenance on the levees from Sioux City to St. Louis. Now that's an example of wrong priorities. 
This amendment ensures that the Corps of Engineers continues to focus on people and keep flood control and navigation as the focus. It's time to get our priorities back and to save tax dollars while we're doing it. That's a good combination. Thank the you. The gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from, from Missouri. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Does anybody seek time in opposition? Gen gentleman from Indiana. Chair, I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Appreciate the recognition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do rise in opposition to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri. The Water 2007 Act, which was passed in such a bipartisan, with such bipartisan support that it overcame a presidential veto, authorized the Corps to undertake the Missouri River Ecosystem Restoration Plan and develop the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee to consult on the study. This authority provided a venue for collaboration between the 70-member stakeholder group of tribes, states, affected groups, and federal agencies to develop a shared vision and comprehensive plan for the restoration of the Missouri River ecosystem. By prohibiting the Corps from expending any fiscal year 2012 funding on the study, this amendment will result in a scheduled delay of the study potentially additional startup expenses and schedule impacts, and potential erosion of trust and a delicate partnership uh, in this basin. There also could be legal implications associated with the National Environmental Policy Act if funding was prohibited for this study in the longer term. A one-year prohibition would not allow work described above to be done and could push the entire schedule of the report out. I also do believe that it places the Army Corps in jeopardy of not being in compliance with the Act, which could also adversely affect their operation of the dams on the waterways. In the long term, the study represents the required programmatic NEPA coverage for the Missouri River Fish and Wildlife Recovery Project and 13 federal agencies, 8 states, and 15 tribes have formally agreed to cooperate with the agency under the Act. The fact that this was authorized in 2007 in an overwhelming fashion, that you have had this collaboration, and that there are risks involved in adopting the gentleman's amendment, uh, I would urge my colleagues to oppose his amendment, and I would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Missouri. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I encourage how much time I have left? 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quickly. Um, I think I understood the gentleman to say that uh, this would affect some of the Corps' operations. This will in no way affect the Corps' operations whatsoever. This is a study that does nothing more than dictate how some things should be done after the study is over with. And in Missouri, our experience with these kind of studies is such that we always come out on the, on the short end. We have farmers and businesses and communities along the river right now who have been dramatically impacted by previous studies which have protected fish and birds over the welfare of our citizens, our communities, and our business. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Indiana. Uh, Chairman, I would suggest that my colleagues' uh, relief stands with the authorizing committees. Uh, we have a law in place since 2007. Uh, perhaps uh, he might want it amended uh, through the uh, authorization process. At this point in time, I think it is unwise policy to slow the study down and would ask of my colleagues to oppose the amendment. The gentleman yields back his time. All time having expired, the questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri. All those in favor signify so by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 70, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Burgess of Texas. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from Texas will control five minutes, and a member opposed to the amendment will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. I thank the gentleman for the recognition. Early this week, 233 members of this body, our colleagues, voted in favor of repealing the 100-watt light bulb ban. This ban comes as a result of the December 2007 energy legislation that included a provision that regulates what type of light bulb the American people may buy and may use in their homes. 
the federal government has no right to tell me or any other citizen what type of light bulb to use at home. It is our right to choose. And clearly a majority of this body, 233 members, agree with the American people. Stay out of the decision making and give the choice back to the consumer. Consumers want the 100 watt light bulb and some consumers need the 100 watt light bulb. Now after our debate on the floor earlier this week, I got this message from a constituent named Dave. Dave wrote, quote, I need my 100 watt light bulb to do the type of work that I do. It is very detailed work. I need to see my work with a 100 watt light bulb and sometimes I use a 200 watt light bulb. It is necessary. I cannot do my work with less wattage because I have to strain my eyes to do my work and that causes me headaches and then I'm unable to work. Those types of light bulbs, 100 watt light bulbs, are like having sunshine at your home and at your workbench. LEDs do not suffice. Neons don't work, nor any other type of new tech bulbs that are so-called energy savers. And I don't want to have to purchase those lights that have mercury in them. Nobody should have the right to dictate what type of lights we choose to buy and use in our homes. I cannot read the very fine, small print of some of the product labels using those weak light bulbs. Stop that ban on those light bulbs that will serve us, the light bulbs that will serve us well with proper light for working on very detailed projects and reading product labels that have very small print. End of the quote from Dave. And Dave should have the right to choose what sort of light bulb he uses when doing his work at home. Now look, I work in a federal building. I understand the federal government gets to tell me what type of light under which I must work in that federal building. But when I go home at night to read my <clears throat> Denton Record Chronicle, I should be able to choose what type of light I use for that illumination. In 2010, the last major GE factory that manufactured the incandescent light bulb closed its doors as a result of the reckless 2007 legislation. And as a direct result, 200 people lost their jobs. This wasn't the only plant to close as a result of that 2007 legislation. These policies kill jobs. It's the clearest example of how real consequences affect real people with this reckless legislation. These jobs are being sent overseas. General Electric has said that the new lights cost about 50% more to make in the U.S. than in China. The over-regulating government policies have to stop. It would not only be better for the environment and our pocketbooks, but it would bring those jobs back to America. My amendment at the desk would give Dave his choice of light and would allow every American, other American to choose, yes, choose, what light bulb they want to use when they're in the comfort of their own home. I'm going to res uh, yield to the gentleman from uh, Pl New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, support the gentleman from Texas' amendment. Pleased to do so. Yield back to you. And I'll reserve the balance of my time. Does anyone seek opposition to the amendment? Gentleman from Indiana. Chairman Rice, in opposition to the gentleman. Gentleman recognized amendment. for five minutes. As the gentleman pointed out, we had this debate earlier this week uh, on the House floor. Uh, I would point out that the performance standards for light bulbs were established uh, in an act in 2007. It's the law of the land. At that time, the bill enjoyed strong bipartisan support with 95 House Republicans voting for final passage and the bill being signed into law by President George Bush. As far as I am aware, the issues that inspired this standard have not changed and if anything, have gotten worse. Families continue to struggle every day to meet rising energy bills, and there are real savings to be had by moving to more efficient illumination. It is estimated that efficient lighting will save the average American family around $100 every year. Further, while claiming that the incandescent bulb is dead makes for a good soundbite, uh, it doesn't reflect reality. As a result of the 2007 law, manufacturers are already making a variety of new energy-saving bulbs for homes, including more efficient incandescent bulbs. These bulbs look light and turn on like those we use, have used for decades, but are 28 to 33 percent more efficient. What we're talking about here is a standard, not the definition of a discrete bulb. Uh, this progress has been made because of the standard and goals that were set in that bill. Uh, I do not think it is time to turn the clock back. I do think we ought to enjoy these energy savings, and I am opposed to the gentleman's amendment and would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Texas. 
Now, the fact is, the United States Congress, the federal government, should not pick winners and losers. Yes, there's new technology. It didn't happen as fast as the proponents of this legislation articulated in December of 2007. And the technology that was promised for five years later, which is now, in fact, has been slow to develop, but it will develop. And then let them meet in the marketplace. Let the consumer decide. Let the consumer pick the winners and losers in this argument, not the United States Congress, not the federal government. We had no business restricting the sale of the 100-watt light bulb. We have no business restricting what light people should use in their homes. This is one time we should back off and let the American people make the choices that are right for them. And I'll yield back the balance General of my time. General yields back his time. General from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I would simply say again, we are talking about a standard that was adopted under law in 2007. Uh, we ought to try to achieve that standard to save energy in this country. I remain opposed to, to the gentleman's amendment. would ask my colleagues to vote no, and I would yield back my time. Gen the questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from uh, Texas, all those in favor signify so by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Mr. Chairman, I ask for the yeas and nays. Is the gentleman requesting a recorded vote? Yes. Yes. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. Gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 80, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Kravak of Minnesota. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from Minnesota will control five minutes, and a gentleman, uh, member of Congress, opposed the amendment will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening. In March of this year, Joanne Ellen Darcy, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, testified before the House Subcommittee on Water Resources and the Environment that the administration is preparing to plan a draft legislation to expand the scope of projects eligible to receive Harbor Trust Fund monies. In the hearing, the Assistant Secretary Darcy alluded to the administration's interest in using Harbor Trust Fund monies for port security, among other things. While I fully support funding port security through the general appropriations process, I oppose the efforts to divert Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund's monies until the federal government demonstrates it has fully used these trust funds to their intended purpose, and that is dredging. As many of you know, the Harbor Maintenance Tax is an ad valorem tax assessed to the maritime shippers that use America's ports. By law, Revenues of this user tax are to be dedicated to the United States Army Corps of Engineers operations and to maintenance budgets to ensure American navigation channels remain dredged to their authorized depths and widths. Despite the significant revenues and the roughly $6 billion supposed balance in the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, our nation's maritime infrastructure has largely fallen into disrepair. Only one-third of our nation's navigation channels are at their authorized depths and widths. Portions of the import Atlantic, import, uh, important Atlantic intercoastal waterway have been closed to commercial navigation due to lack of maintenance dredging. Eight out of ten of our nation's largest harbors are not dredged at their authorized depths and widths. Mr. Chairman, make no mistake, this has a direct impact on American job creation and prosperity. When American ships have to light load to clear the shallowest channel, American economic productivity is lost. For example, for each inch silted in, the American Laker fleet collectively, per voyage, leaves 8,000 tons of Minnesota ore on the docks in Duluth. That's enough to produce over 6,000 cars. I know I don't have to tell the ranking member and fellow Steel Caucus member what this means. Moreover, light loading causes increased transportation costs for our exports, decreases our national economic competitiveness. Every billion dollars in exports, Mr. Chairman, translates to 15,000 American jobs. Given the economic straits we are in, it is imperative we don't hold back American business with increased transportation costs caused by unmaintained channels. We must, Mr. Chairman, ensure the monies intended for dredging are not siphoned off for other programs. My amendment will permit monies from being used to the administration to develop a plan for draft legislation to expand the scope of the projects eligible to receive Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund monies. American shippers are taxed specifically to maintain channels they and our nation depend on. It is imperative we ensure that Harbor Trust Fund monies be spent as they are intended 
thereby ensuring American competitiveness and the proliferation of American jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I reserve the balance of the gentleman my time. gentleman reserves his time. Who seeks time in opposition? gentleman from New Jersey. I do not seek time in opposition, but I move to strike the last word. gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, let me thank the gentleman for his amendment and tell him that I am uh, please, pleased to accept it. And I know that you included the fact that you wouldn't have to tell the ranking uh, the important purpose of your uh, amendment. I, I also share those same sentiments. We, we don't want to degrade uh, the purposes for the Harbor Maintenance Fund from the express purposes now. Too many priorities that are out there. We don't need to expand them. So I'm very pleased to lend my support. And I'm sure I would be happy if you would be so willing to I yield to you my, yield my time. I would associate myself with your support of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman yields Go back. back. Gentleman from Missouri. No. I mean, Minnesota. from Minnesota. Minnesota, sir. And uh, I thank the gentleman for their kind comments, and I yield back, sir. Questions on the amendment? The gentleman from Minnesota. All those in favor signify so by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The gentleman from California. I have an amendment at the desk. Mm -hmm. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Rohrbacher of California. Page 62, after line 2, insert the following new section. Section 609. Of the funds made available by this act for carrying out Section 1703 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the amount of funds made available by the Secretary to carry out projects described in subsection B5 of that section shall not exceed the amount of funds made available by the Secretary to carry out projects described in subsection B4 that use coolants different from those commercial technologies that are in service at the time the guarantee is issued. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from New Jersey. I reserve a point of order Ge on the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves a point of order pursuant to the order of the House today. The gentleman from California and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of my amendment, which would require uh, that the amount provided for in Title 17 of the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Bill for loan guarantees for advanced <clears throat> nuclear energy facilities be equal or exceed that for loan guarantees uh, targeted for carbon capture and sequestration projects. In layman terms, in layman's terms, my amendment would specify that we cannot use more funds in this act for loan guarantees for carbon capture and sequestration projects than we can uh, then that we make available for projects using nuclear technologies such as small modular gas cooled reactors. The purpose for this is simple. These new technologies hold significant promise uh, of meeting our ever increasing energy needs with safe clean, reliable, cost-effective, proliferation-resistant, non-carbon-producing, American-built nuclear reactors. As a member of the Science Committee, uh, I have, long, along with my colleagues, have studied this technology over the past seven years. And let me note, the bureaucracy has studied this technology almost to death. Well, the time has come for st that study be left behind. It's time for the study to be over, and it's time for us to act. There are commercial companies out there right now trying to bring these technologies to market, and this amendment will help make this a reality. I would like to also note that G the GAO and the committee have stated that there is a lack of transparency in this loan guarantee program. We cannot expect to perform proper oversight without knowing where and how these funds are being used. And it is critical that we become more specific in stating that the, how we intend the funds to be used. And that's why this, that this amendment would do. It would also be important that we require the administration to report back to Congress with a full, uh, a full explanation of how these funds are being used. Thus, I ask for uh, support for this amendment. Does the gentleman from New Jersey continue to reserve a point of order or insist on his point of order? Yes, I do. 
I reserve my point of order. The chair is. Does, does I, anyone else wish to be? The gentleman reserves his point of order. Who seeks time in opposition? I rise in opposition, Mr. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment, but may I say I've always found him to be very thoughtful and considerate, and I know that he's extremely knowledgeable about this and is committed for us to the whole issue of taking a look at these types of loan guarantees. When we put together our bill, we had several guiding principles, and chief among them was to get the federal government out of the private sector's way. You should understand that. The loan guarantee program is at the heart of that debate, and our bill begins to ramp down this temporary program while including funding to help new technologies so that the private sector can take them over. Your amendment, however, appears to dictate which technologies should receive funding through this program and which should not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, responsible private sector entities have sunken literally hundreds of millions of dollars into their applications, and this amendment would, I think, potentially cut off those applicants despite their investments in good faith efforts. And even more importantly, however, the amendment would determine which technologies win and which would lose. I don't think in our committee or in this Congress we should be determining the winners and losers we should let the market decide. So I'd ask my colleagues to oppose the amendment, and I do insist on my point of order. Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Be, yeah. Will the gentleman kindly state his point of order? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitute legislation on an appropriation bill, and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part, an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law requires a new determination. I ask for a ruling from the chair. Uh, Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? Uh, gentleman from California. Uh, I believe that it is Congress's job uh, to make decisions. We're the ones who should be actually designating exactly where money is going. I'm a senior member of the uh, Science and Technology Committee. Uh, we have studied this issue directly, and we, this is my recommendation. And uh, I think that uh, this is what we're supposed to do here, is make sure that uh, rather than having money uh, saying that we can just spend all we want on sequestration and accepting that alternative, that we must can designate uh, what we think is the best use and most efficient use of the taxpayer money. That sounds uh, within the rules to me. Okay. The chair uh, is prepared to rule on the point of order. The chair finds that this amendment includes language requiring a new determination of whether a certain type of coolant is used on a project. The amendment therefore constitutes a violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained, and the amendment is not in order. I have another amendment at the desk. Gentleman from California. The court will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Rohrbacher of California. Page 62, after line 2, insert the following. Section 609, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to carry out projects described in Section 1703B5 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, 42 United States Code 16513B5. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from California will control five minutes, and a member opposed the amendment uh, will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. I rise in support of my amendment, which would require that none of the funds provided for in Title 17 of the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Bill be used for the purposes of providing loan guarantees for, quote, carbon capture and sequestration projects. Uh, if you can, uh, uh, if you think that carbon capture and sequestration is an important goal, and I'm sure there are some people who believe it is, uh, let me just note that I do not believe that. And I think that uh, uh, having heard the debates uh, uh, that have been going on about this, this particular issue over, over the years, that there are a large number of my colleagues who do not believe that as well. Well, if you do not believe in carbon sequestration and capture as an important goal, uh, then uh, I would suggest uh, that the uh, best sequestration, if you really believe that we must sequester carbon and, uh, and that that's an important goal, 
then let me suggest this, then that's what my amendment is. It's better to leave the oil and coal in the ground if that's what you really want to do is capture this carbon and sequester the carbon uh, and capture it. By promoting, uh, and I would suggest, the best way to do that is promoting uh, new nuclear technologies such as the new inherently safe small modular nuclear reactors, especially those that do not use water as a coolant. We can provide all, uh, we can provide all the clean, safe electricity that we need. And I would hope that any funds that the Secretary might have uh, in terms of, of his opinion uh, d determined to use in carbon uh, capture and sequestration instead that the secretary will use that limited amount of money that he's got available to him on a positive program that will permit us an alternative to oil and gas. Uh, I personally, however, do not believe that oil and gas necessarily and the capture of carbon sequestration is an important goal, but if you do, uh, you should be supporting instead of, of, of uh, of basically using that as an expensive tool that will hurt the economy, we should be using the funds that are available uh, instead to promote this positive alternative of nuclear energy, uh, especially the high temperature gas cool reactor. And I uh, uh, reserve the balance of my Gentleman time. Gentleman reserves his time. Who takes time in opposition? Gentleman from New Jersey? Yeah, I, I uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to Gentleman's the recognized gentleman's amendment. And, and of course, as I said earlier, uh, respectfully, uh, I, I still think his, his amendment, this amendment, as with the previous one, uh, is, is an issue of de that we're determining winners and losers, and, and my belief is that the market uh, should decide. And l let me say the committee is strongly supportive of the whole issue and development of, of small uh, modular nuclear reactors. And it's amazing how much interest there is out there. Yes. I mean, and some incredible ingenuity that's going into it. The, the people that have passed through my doors. We, we do have a, a support for uh, nuclear loan guarantees. I think a, a, a $11 billion on, in, in unused funds and $6 billion for, for fossil fuels. So we, we, we have money available for the development of these types of technologies, which are, I think oh, uh, hopefully you'll find to be reassuring. But for the reasons I said either earlier without repeating myself again, uh, I oppose your amendment at this time. Uh, I the would, gentleman uh, reserve his time. And I, I much, reserve my time. Gentleman from California. And how much time do I have? Two and, and a half minutes. Yes. Uh, well, let me just suggest that, again, we should be taking responsibility, especially when we see something as important to the American people as the issue of, of energy and how we are going to, especially clean energy, of how we are going to make sure that it's supplied to the people of the United States, using just specifically designating that uh, uh, these funds won't be used for uh, sequestration and uh, carbon capture. I mean, that seems to me that that's what we should do. And uh, we should determine whether or not we believe this is an appropriate use of, uh, uh, of, government, of government funds. I suggest that it is not, especially when we have alternatives that are available to us, uh, like these, these new technologies in the nuclear field that can give us uh, uh, what we need in terms of not, provo not producing carbon and, not, uh, and, and uh, making sure that you don't even need sequestration then. Well, if you have those alternatives, well, then we shouldn't be spending the money on this other approach, on the, on the carbon sequestration, uh, capture and sequestration approach. Uh, that makes sense to me. We need, as, as members of Congress, to set these type of parameters on the, on the spending of, of our limited dollars in a way that will have the most uh, positive impact. And capturing the carbon capture and sequestration uh, concept is not the best way to spend our money when we have these other alternatives. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from New Jersey. The gentleman from New Jersey yields back. The gentleman from California. And I yield back the gentleman yields back. Please. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor signify so by saying aye. 
Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And I uh, not a request in a recorded Pursuant vote. to clause 6 of rule 18 for the proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Report, report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Roy Bacher of California, page 62 after line 2, insert the following. Section 609. Not less than 10 percent of the funds made available by this act for carrying out Section 1703 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, 42 U.S.C. 16513 shall be available for carrying out projects described in subsection B4 of such section that use coolants different from those commercial technologies that are in service at the time the guarantee is issued. Pursuant to the order of the House today, the gentleman from California, Mr. Chairman, I the gentleman from New Jersey, point of order. 